attack on the USA. Four airliners are hijacked, turned into devastating bombs. Thousands of people are feared dead. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. The world, shaken, recoils in horror. This is a special extended edition of The National. Good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge in Toronto on a night like no other. The world is in shock tonight. The United States on high alert. The result of terror attacks never seen before. Audacious and devastating. A calamity witnessed by millions this morning on television. At 8.45, hijackers crashed an airliner into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. Just 20 minutes later, a second plane plowed into the South Tower. Smoke and flames shot above. Debris and the doomed fell below. Then, around 9.40, another explosion, this time in Washington. Another hijacked plane hit the Pentagon. And just after 10 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed and vanished in a cloud of dust, soon followed by the I other live. building. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. At 10.10 10 a.m., a fourth airplane crashed outside of Pittsburgh. The images are extraordinary, the impact only beginning. It's impossible to know the number of casualties, whether they're in the hundreds, the thousands, or the tens of thousands. But one thing is certain, New York City is changed tonight, from the mood of its people to the look of its skyline. Reporter Steve Irwin is in Manhattan tonight. Steve. Peter, New York's nightmare began just as most people were coming into work when a hijacked passenger plane flew straight into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Smoke poured out of the skyscraper, and the scene was a mess. Then, less than 30 minutes later, it happened again. A second plane was hijacked, and as people around the world watched on television, it flew straight into the other tower, punching a huge hole through the building. And I heard a roar, and I looked around thinking that it had to be a helicopter, and I looked up and I saw the second plane hit. It had to be a commercial-sized airliner. What went through your mind? Uh, that it couldn't be real. Just that it couldn't be real. We thought it was an accident. When we heard there was a second one, we definitely thought it was terrorism at that point. There are typically some 50,000 people working every day in these 110-story buildings. Those inside began to flee while emergency workers rushed in a frenzy to the scene. As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy-duty explosion and everybody just started running for the door. Everybody was trapped. Eventually, when the dust lifted, I saw some light and started screaming for everybody to go out towards the light. As soon as the building, as soon as it got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. Were, you, uh, were there other people that were hurt, were lying There here? was a lot of people hurt. They were lying on the floors, coming down the stairs. A lot of people had asthma attacks while they were coming down. It was... It was bad. A, a big explosion happened. Some guy came out. He was, his skin was all off. I helped him out. This is him all over. There's people jumping out of windows. I've seen at least 14 people jumping out of windows. It's, it's, it's horrific. I can't believe this is happening. Well, the firefighter, somebody with little light came eventually, and we were following him. And go to. What did you do? I'm he, sorry. He, the police officer told everybody to form a human chain, and we held on to each other, and he flashed the light, and he directed us to building five, and we went out building five. Did you see people bleeding, and what, what did you see? Oh, everybody could see. Do you want blood? Here's blood. Everybody's bleeding. People are laying all over the floor. It's horrible. And I was there the first time, and this is twice. But there was an even greater catastrophe. The South Tower, its steel beams apparently melting from heat and fuel, collapsed on itself. I hope I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car.
Unbelievably, a half hour later, that scene too repeated itself. Floor after floor of falling debris. Billowing smoke and soot seem to cover the lower portion of Manhattan Island. There was panic everywhere. And late this afternoon, word that another building at the World Trade Center complex has collapsed. New York officials were stunned and somber. And we will uh, strive now very hard to save as many people as possible and to send a message that the city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists. New York was brought to a standstill today. Financial markets, the subways, even the United Nations, all closed and could be again tomorrow. Peter? Thanks, Steve. Steve Irwin reporting for us tonight from New York City. And New York was just the beginning, as the horror of what happened at the World Trade Center was still just starting to sink in. Reports started coming in from Washington of explosions and fireballs, then the chilling news that a passenger jet had crashed into the Pentagon, leaving a gaping hole in the military nerve center of the U.S. The CBC's Adrian Arsenault joins us for that story. Adrian. Peter, this is a very somber Washington, D.C. right now. We're about two blocks from the White House. We're surrounded by government buildings, and security here is extremely tight because this is a city now in a state of emergency as the hundreds of thousands of people who work here were sent home earlier in the panic of this unbelievable day. Before their eyes, the terror of New York flew into their own backyard. At 9.45 a.m., an explosion at the Pentagon. And the next thing I know, there was this tremendous explosion as it hit the Pentagon. I looked right the military nerve center of the United States, workplace of more than 20,000 people under attack. A hijacked American Airlines 757 with 64 people on board had just left Dulles, Virginia, en route to Los Angeles. Then it changed course and crashed into the West Wing. All five floors collapsed. And an enormous gap has been cut in this building. Mercifully, Pentagon officials say the plane hit a newly renovated and minimally staffed section of the building. But death here would be unavoidable. As the effects of the escalating catastrophe started to sink in, the United States military at home and overseas was put on the highest alert. And in Washington, a state of emergency was declared. Everybody back. Everybody back. The White House, the Capitol building, all empty. And by mid-morning, every federal building in Washington was evacuated, sending nearly a quarter of a million people into the streets. Across town, early, unconfirmed reports of an explosion at or near the State Department. On any other day, that would be crisis enough. Here, today, it just gets added to a horrible list. Very angry. Very angry that somebody has such callous disregard for human life. And it would continue. Just before noon, a fourth commercial jet crashed just outside Pittsburgh. A passenger aboard the United Airlines plane had called police to report a hijacking only moments before it went down in a cornfield. I happened to hear a plane come through. It sounded like it was running normal. When it come down over top of me, I seen it go head nose dive straight into the ground down here. By midday, for the first time ever, the Federal Aviation Authority grounded every aircraft in the United States, diverted incoming flights. As of right now, nothing will be flying into or out of here until at least noon Wednesday. But there is some activity in these skies. Throughout the day, fighter jets have been patrolling the air around Washington. And as we understand it, their orders are quite clear. If a plane enters restricted airspace and cannot be urged out, then it will be shot down. Peter? Adrian, still reports from New York tonight that they're having an awful time trying to get towards the rubble to do any kind of rescue operation that may still be possible because they're still fighting fires and still trying to gas or cap gas leaks. What about at the scene of the crash at the Pentagon? What's the latest from there tonight? Well, earlier we had believed that it was starting to calm down, but recently we've been seeing pictures of flames coming from the Pentagon. So there is a sense that it's not getting better. It might just be getting worse, that, that the fire within the building itself might be spreading. Whether that's because of the jet fuel or, or some other cause, we're not clear on yet. We do believe that most of the people who were in the uh, Pentagon have now uh, left the building, but we don't yet know why the fires are burning. 
All right, Adrian Arsenal reporting to us tonight from Washington. U.S. President George Bush was not in Washington at the time of the Pentagon attack, but as you may have seen, he is there now. And he's assuring the nation that while a powerful symbol of the U.S. government may have been attacked, the government itself is still operating smoothly. With more on the president's response to this Tuesday of terror, here's the CBC's David Holton. David. Well, Peter, some are already describing this as the cruelest day in U.S. history, a day that, you know, in a sense, shattered a nation's sense of its own security. Ready? Kite! Yes, kite. Get ready. It's just after 9 a.m. President Bush is at an education event when an aide gives him the first whispered news of the New York bombings. His face clouds with anxiety. At the count of three, everyone should be on page. Minutes later, his first official response. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. For more than three hours, though, as U.S. forces at home and abroad are put on the highest alert, nothing more is heard from Bush or any other senior official. Public fears aren't eased when Bush flies to an Air Force base in Louisiana apparently still unsure that it would be safe to return to Washington. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. A terrible, terrible tragedy has befallen my nation, but has befallen... More words of defiance from Secretary of State Colin Powell on a visit to Peru. They can destroy buildings, they can kill people, and we will be saddened by this tragedy, but they will never be allowed to kill the spirit of democracy. As thousands flee downtown Washington, down whole area. there's confusion, shock, and disbelief. We can't move. We can't get anywhere. Um, everybody's concerned that there might be other buildings targeted. Now I know what my parents felt like on Pearl Harbor Day. It's really inconceivable to us that people would, someone would do that, and so you really can't understand the enemy. But in this case, was the enemy Osama bin Laden? U.S. officials already say bin Laden is their prime suspect, that only his terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, has the resources and sophistication to carry out today's coordinated attacks. But in Afghanistan, where bin Laden is based, representatives of the Taliban government denied that he's involved. Come on, please, let us, uh, we strongly condemn it. We want investigation to be carried out. We could hear detonation coming from that uh, northern area as well. Later, explosions and rocket fire lit up the night sky around the Afghan capital. Washington quickly denied that this was a U.S. retaliation attack and said the fighting was started by Afghan rebels. In no way is the United States government connected to those explosions. This evening, Bush returned to the White House after an unexplained visit to the Strategic Air Command headquarters in Nebraska. This was part of his address to the nation tonight. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Bush also ordered federal departments to reopen tomorrow, obviously wanting to send a signal that the government here won't be knocked off course by the bombings. But, you know, no one has any illusions here that it may be a long time before Americans feel safe again. Peter? David, in a city that can be so often split in a nasty way by partisan matters, uh, what is the sense of unity there in Washington tonight? Tremendous show of solidarity on Capitol Hill uh, all afternoon, uh, Peter. The Democrats rallying behind, saying they will rally behind uh, President Bush. How long will that last for? That's the issue. Already questions are being asked about uh, why four hijackings could take place. What about airport security? Also, and perhaps more patently, why there appears to have been a huge intelligence failure in the fact that even officials here are, are, are openly admitting now that they, were, they had no advance warning of today's attacks. All right, David Holton reporting us uh, for us tonight uh, from Washington. The shockwaves from today's horror travel to Ottawa, putting the national capital on alert. Prime Minister Chrétien appealed for calm and said the government had beefed up security here just in case. And he offered the U.S., Canada sympathy and whatever help it needs. Here's Paul Hunter. 
it didn't take long for the effect of the attack to be felt in Ottawa. Heightened security was everywhere. Police doubled their numbers on the streets just in case something were to happen here. At the U.S. Embassy, the biggest and most important American building in Canada, all non-essential workers were told to go home. Sir, can we get your reaction to what's going on inside? I, no, no comment right now. Thank you. Those who worked nearby wondered, could the U.S. Embassy be a target? I'm really scared. I want to get as far away from here as possible. The Prime Minister heard about the attack during a breakfast in Ottawa with Saskatchewan Premier Lorne Calvert. We have talked with the RCMP, the, uh, with the Solicitor General and the head of the RCMP, and with the Chief of Staff and Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army, and everybody has increased the level of, of security everywhere. Planes on the way in. That was made clear in the sky above Whitehorse this afternoon. Canadian fighter jets tracked a Korean plane when there were fears of a possible hijacking. It turned out the plane was simply having fuel troubles, having circled for too long. Those in charge of Canadian security said they were indeed doing all they could. We have a very strong security intelligence teams in the U.S. and in this country. Obviously, there's been a, a desperate, terrifying act of terrorism that we will all have to deal with. I can assure you we are doing everything possible to gather the very best intelligence so that we can use that intelligence to respond appropriately to whatever threat there is to Canadians and uh, obviously other uh, embassies and so on in Canada. Even so, the Israeli embassy in this Ottawa office building was evacuated anyway, as were all Israeli embassies around the world. Here, nearby office workers were sent home early, too, just in case. Just sheer relief fell over the whole office, you know. Relief in the end that nothing terrible happened here, with sympathy on behalf of all Canadians for victims of the horrific act. Canadians uh, will uh, show their solidarity, solidarity with our neighbours, and uh, the news to come uh, are when we discover the number of people who died will be probably very tragic. Some Canadians are already expressing their feelings here at the U.S. Embassy. Tonight, bringing flowers, cards and poems in a show of sorrow and sympathy for Americans everywhere. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Ottawa. The Foreign Affairs Department says it will be at least a day before it's known how many Canadians may have died today. But one Canadian death has been confirmed. Garnet Ace Bailey from Lloydminster, Saskatchewan. His family is confirmed he was a passenger on one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center. Bailey was the director of pro scouting for the Los Angeles Kings and a former member of the Edmonton Oilers. He was one of two members of the LA Kings scouting team who was on the plane. Obviously, a very busy night in the national capital. Joining us now from the CBC's Parliamentary Bureau, just uh, uh, on Wellington Street in the nation's capital, Jason Moskovitz, our chief political correspondent. Jason, we've had a sense from Paul's item what's been happening in front of the cameras. What do we know about what's been happening away from the cameras, the kind of discussions that have been going on there? Well, the Prime Minister has spent the day being briefed to 24 Sussex. He talked to the head of the Security Service, the RCMP, the head of the Armed Forces, and because cabinet ministers were across the country and couldn't get here because the airports were closed, he talked to uh, key cabinet ministers on the telephone. The prime minister has also offered all the help that Canada can give to the U.S. at this time. He told reporters that uh, he phoned President Bush. He hasn't had an opportunity to speak to him as of yet. And also, Peter, we should point out that there were a series of cancellations today. The Prime Minister was supposed to go to Halifax. He was supposed to be there tonight, in fact, at a fundraising dinner. He cancelled that this morning. The Prime Minister of Slovakia was to visit Canada. That trip was cancelled. And the Prime Minister was to go to Stockholm on Thursday. Thirteen other countries were to be represented at this conference on global globalization and new technologies. That, too, was cancelled. As for New York City, next week, a special session at the United Nations. Uh, no one knows yet whether that will be cancelled as well. Already speculation in the United States that we're going to see a very different kind of air travel system in the days ahead, the years ahead now as a result of what happened today. Uh, the same kind of speculation one assumes must be going around Ottawa as well about the impact of what happened today in, in terms of the way we live our lives in the future. Certainly uh, the RCMP will be at every airport in the country as never before. 
in the days ahead when the airports do open and Canadians and Americans and perhaps people all over the world will go through security the likes of which they've never seen. Now, of course, the House has not been sitting uh, this week. It uh, reopens after the uh, summer break next week. But uh, reaction from, from other political leaders today? Well, it's the same as the Prime Minister. Just this horrifying expression of grief, regret, and everything that goes with it, Peter. All right, Jason Moskowitz reporting to us tonight uh, from Parliament Hill in the nation's capital. Many Canadians may want to help Americans on a personal level. The Canadian Blood Services says there will be an urgent need for blood donations in the coming days. To find out the location of clinics and hours you, of operation, you can call 1-888-2-DONATE. And a check on Canadians who may have been caught in the attacks. Foreign Affairs has a 24-hour emergency service. That number is 1-800-387-3124. Please be advised, both numbers are extremely busy. As we've mentioned, soon after the carnage began, the call for help was raised. And as Matthew Pace reports, people in this country were quick to answer it. They heard the news and saw the images, then lined up to help giving blood in Vancouver. We've, ha we've had an unbelievable response from our donors. In Ottawa. Horrified, it felt like you're looking at a movie, but it's obviously not. In Calgary. Really wanted to, you know, give and do what I had to do from this end. Canadians doing what they had to do to help their closest neighbors. There's going to be a need for immediate care and comfort. These people have obviously suffered tremendous uh, shocks to their system. That will direct the operation on a national level. We'll the Canadian Red Cross is coordinating much of the relief effort. Tracing service can I help you? Helping Canadians find American friends and relatives who may have been caught in the violence. They really want to know, uh, are their family members involved? Um, are they hurt? Um, can they help them? But mostly they're doing whatever they're asked to do. Coordination is the key thing. Uh, the important thing in terms of help coming in from the outside is that it comes through the appropriate channels and that they coordinate that. Ontario Premier Mike Harris says people in his province and others are ready to pitch in. We have offered assistance to the United States and New York governments. I have instructed all branches of the provincial government that Ontario will provide whatever support is needed. Doctors, nurses, emergency workers are all prepared to offer their support. The first and foremost thing that we'll look at is whether we can offer any assistance in the health care field uh, because the priority becomes uh, on the living. So people such as Alia Galani are just waiting for the call. If I can just help one person, I mean, it'll be a lot, but I know it's going to be uh, a lot. Uh, um, I know maybe we're going to work like uh, 16 hours or 18 hours a day when we go there and uh, I'm ready for that. Ready to help out in a relief effort that's only just begun. Matthew Pace, CBC News, Montreal. It has been a chaotic day at Canadian airports. All flights out were cancelled and hundreds of flights headed for the U.S. landed here instead. As the CBC's Susan Ormiston reports, airports and passengers are finding it hard to cope. It's awful. I'm afraid it's the end of the world. Just one passenger on hundreds of aircraft destined for the U.S., but rerouted to Canadian airports. This man in Toronto hosted 200 New York guests at his daughter's wedding last night. They're stranded. Uh, the groom's uh, sister left uh, a four-week-old child with a nurse who can't get... They can't even get through. The nurse is supposed to leave. They can't even... The phones are all tied up. It's total chaos. By mid-morning, all airports in Canada were closed. All scheduled flights cancelled. Our priority has been to receive diverted flights that were bound to uh, destinations within the U.S. The same everywhere. In Halifax, 7,000 travelers stuck, many still on the tarmac tonight. In Newfoundland, up to 15,000 unexpected passengers. City. Gander. Gander. Oh. Vancouver took the load of Asian flights. The massive effort got thanks from Washington. So we owe our Canadian neighbors a debt of gratitude for helping us as we redirected. Many passengers coming off the flights here in Toronto had very few details of what had happened. They were confused and frustrated by the change in their travel plans. Their shock would come later. Total shock and disbelief sounds like something out of a movie. 
they turned off TVs at Pearson Airport, but in Gander, stranded travelers were horrified. There's the plane, you can't miss that. All over, passengers had to wait hours for luggage and then try to get a rental car, a bus, or a room. These travelers herded into a hotel ballroom. There are no more rooms. Back on the other side of the fence, please. Airports were on high security alert. Tactical police on patrol, dogs and bomb detection equipment in use, and in the air, too, tighter security. Unlike a weather delay or an airline strike, travelers weren't as much testy as nervous. I just want to get out of here. I feel like a sitting duck, to be quite honest. Even the airport chaplain had a busy day. Every few feet, somebody would stop and talk to us. Just, just wanted to talk. Just wanted to let out steam. Transport Canada will decide when planes will resume flying. For now, Canadian airports are still closed and travelers' plans in disarray. The world's not what it was 24 hours ago. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. Traffic at many of Canada's border crossings has slowed to a crawl as officials check every car and every traveler. Ian Hanamansing, the CBC's Canada Now anchor, reports from the crossing near White Rock, British Columbia. At the Peace Arch border crossing atop the monument to the longest undefended border in the world, two flags at half-mast, half-staff. A symbol of the tragedy that today trumped the optimism of the words inscribed on the arch, may these gates never be closed. This gate to the United States was sealed shut for about 20 minutes this morning. And when it reopened, it was at the highest level of security, what customs officers call a code one. The last time border checks were this thorough was on the eve of the millennium celebrations in 1999, after Ahmed Rassam was caught trying to smuggle explosives from British Columbia to Washington state. U.S. citizens were allowed back into their country today, slowly, most non-Americans, at this crossing at least, were turned away. These Canadians were headed to Oregon for a convention. And then he said, I'm sorry, you cannot go through the very easy thing. Only Americans are allowed to go through. On the Canadian side, heightened security as well. And at a crossing where usually more than 300 cars an hour would stream past, by midday, only about 75 vehicles each hour were trickling through. One veteran police officer said he's never seen this level of security at the border. I've been policing in this area for over the course of some 35 years. As far as on an emergent reaction, no, I've never encountered this type of slowdown. It was a similar scene as some of the other major crossings. The Windsor-Detroit tunnel was shut down for about five hours. And on the Ambassador Bridge, massive backups. At Niagara Falls, no complaints about the slow traffic but outrage from Americans over the attacks. Whoever did it, I hope they really get the crap knocked out of them. I mean, they will, as the Americans stand together. It's a sad day uh, for, for America. Uh, I'm still proud to be an American, but uh, we, we need to straighten this out real quick and go after the parties. All out war, that's what it is, just like Pearl Harbor. At this hour, the Peace Arch Crossing, about a 45-minute drive from Vancouver, it is very quiet. It is, of course, the supper hour here on the west coast of Canada, and usually it would be much busier here, but probably only about a dozen cars waiting to get into both the United States and Canada. Peter? Ian, we've heard about the Code 1 uh, alert on the American side of the border. What is the situation in terms of, uh, of security on the Canadian side right now? Well, many of our viewers are used to coming to the border crossings, coming back into Canada, and often simply being asked, are you Canadian, and being let through. A much different story tonight, uh, as cars approach the border crossing on the Canadian side, first of all, there's an immigration officer there, that's quite unusual. That officer is uh, trying to verify identification, so for those who don't have passports, say they have driver's licenses, for example, the immigration officer often asks a couple of follow-up questions to try to verify that information, and then a gauntlet of, uh, of customs officers are in the next lane and uh, we've seen as many as three or four going through glove compartments, trunks and boxes in the back of pickup trucks. So at this hour, Peter, at least at this border crossing, it's much quieter and much more secure than usual. Peter? All right, Ian, thanks very much. Ian Hanneman Singh reporting to us from the BC Washington State border. Well, the, uh, and uh, we'll be joining more coverage in just a moment. back.
Iraq. The global reaction to the death and destruction was swift. Almost every world leader lined up behind the U.S. to condemn the attacks. And as Don Murray reports, they were also bracing for trouble of their own. The world watched transfixed. This was London. It could have been any major city in Europe this afternoon. Television pictures gathered crowds. They evoked curiosity, disbelief, and then horror. Traders were moved from the London Stock Exchange. They, too, watched the televised pictures in disbelief. Some left one of London's main financial office buildings. The American firm sent their workers home. Rapidly, police forces around the continent were put on alert. Security was noticeably heavier at the American Embassy in London. By the end of the afternoon, the impact was most obvious at airports. London's Heathrow was filled with passengers whose planes, headed for the U.S., had been turned back in the air. The chorus of condemnation from European political leaders was swift and unanimous. Germany's Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder talked of the revulsion his government and his country felt at these attacks. Russian President Vladimir Putin described the attacks as an evil blow against all civilized people. What happened today, he says, underlines the importance of Russia's proposal to unite all the forces of international society to fight terrorism. Britain's Prime Minister Tony Blair emerged from an emergency meeting of his senior ministers to say his country would stand shoulder to shoulder with the U.S. in a crusade to eliminate such earlier, attacks. This mass terrorism is the new evil in our world. The people who perpetrate it have no regard whatever for the sanctity or value of human life. And we, the democracies of the world, must come together to defeat it and eradicate it. This evening, NATO ambassadors met in Brussels just hours after all non-essential NATO employees had been sent home from the alliance's headquarters. Tomorrow, the European foreign ministers will meet in emergency session. But this furious round of diplomatic discussion barely conceals the obvious. No one in power on this side of the Atlantic has any real idea how this happened or what will happen next. Don Murray, CBC News, London. Now from Europe to the Middle East, a region that's no stranger to suicide attacks. But the scope of today's events was shocking by any standards. Still, there were pockets of Palestinians who celebrated today's attacks. Joining us with the latest from the Middle East, the CBC's Neil MacDonald. Neil. Peter, the mood here in Jerusalem, and I think it's safe to say in the Palestinian territories and elsewhere in the Arab world, is a somber one. There's a feeling here of great foreboding. If, and I say if, these attacks were perpetrated by Arab extremists, then Israel is inevitably drawn into the equation, as are the Palestinians and other Arab states. For the past year, especially since the election of President Bush, Israel and the United States of America have become synonymous in the mind of the Arab street. To a great many Arabs, both countries are now bitter enemies. And that explains some of the scenes we saw here today. In Arab East Jerusalem, groups of people took to the street, celebrating, toasting Osama bin Laden and generally hailing whomever managed to inflict such a lethal blow against Israel's closest ally and greatest protector. There were similar celebrations in the cities of the West Bank and in the Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon. Most Arab leaders, though, understanding the sheer foolishness of taunting Americans at a time like this, were greatly restrained. First of all, I am offering my condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American president. President Bush, to his government, to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Palestinian extremist groups, though, issued cold denials and took the opportunity to lecture the United States. We are opposed to U.S. oppression, said this leader of Hamas, itself a group that has dispatched suicide bombers. We call upon the U.S. to take fair stands and not take Israel's side. Uh, we deny our responsibility, but we call upon the uh, American administration 
to review uh, their uh, attitude and their policy towards the Palestinian question because this policy arouses the anger and the hatred uh, of our people and of all uh, Arab and Islamic peoples. The terror attacks Israeli leaders universally expressed grief and condolences and declared a national day of mourning. The fight against terror is an international struggle of the free world against the forces of darkness who seek to destroy our liberty and our way of life. This was not an attack just against America. It was an attack against civilization, an attempt to bring us back to a jungle where everybody will be full of fear. On the popular Israeli political program, Popolitika, an Israeli general called for the immediate liquidation of Yasser Arafat. And from a former prime minister. We here in Israel have been standing and fighting at the front line against terrorism for years. But now terrorism is struck at the heart of freedom. And this is exactly what this battle is. It's a battle between the forces of tyranny and terrorism and the forces of freedom and democracy. And that, no doubt, is how the Arabs of the Middle East now fear the lines will be drawn, with them cast irretrievably as terrorists and the word Islam synonymous with atrocity in the Western mind. No, it's probably safe to say that most people here, Arab and Jew, now feel their lives have, have changed uh, the, and, and that the geopolitical lines here have shifted reality. Certainly, the current Palestinian intifada, the uprising, is going to be seen in quite a different light beginning now. Peter? Neil, uh, at any time a, a major event has an impact uh, on the Middle East, uh, you have to weigh carefully the impact that it can have on either side in the historic dispute. There seems to be a sense uh, that as awful as this is, uh, the event that's happened in the United States today, that on, on the side of Israel expressing its shock and horror at what's happened, it almost seems that they feel that this can have an impact for them of a beneficial nature. Well, Peter, you heard the sorrow and the sympathy that was expressed by Israeli leaders today, and it's genuine, but I think at the same time, there is sort of a glimmer of grim satisfaction that the rest of the world has met Israel's enemy and, and in a very sudden way. You know, uh, and I think Israeli leaders are hoping that the, that the world will close ranks with them. That's what they're asking for. I think to a certain extent that has begun. Simply the use of the word terrorism. Western news agencies and governments have been cherry about using that word with regard to this conflict up to now, viewing it largely as a political construct. Uh, that's changed. The word terrorism is certainly on our uh, style book now, and it's being used widely by Western news agencies. And I think just that is the start of uh, the world's perception, perhaps growing a little bit closer to Israel's about this sort of thing. And that will certainly be welcome to the leadership here. All right. And underlining, as you have been throughout the day, I know it's early uh, tomorrow morning in Jerusalem right now in terms of uh, the uh, time schedule here in this side of the Atlantic. But underlining, as you have all day, still no indication who was responsible for this. All kinds of fingers being pointed. But at this hour, still no firm indication of who is responsible. Neil McDonald reporting to us tonight uh, from Jerusalem. Now, more reaction from on the ground in the United States. Buffalo, New York is just a stone's throw from Ontario. Dan Bjarnason was in that city today. He saw people stunned, people outraged, and people desperate to help their neighbors. In Buffalo, New York, as word of the catastrophe rippled across the city, security was tightened at many government centers, including City Hall, which shut down, and flags were lowered one by one. In the handful of shopping plazas that stayed open, there were few actual shoppers. Those few were mostly drawn to electronic stores, where they were glued to TV newscasts as the full horror grew by the hour. It's been reported, uh, our David Ensor has reported that... The Red Cross in Buffalo was holding blood donor clinics today, never dreaming the events in New York and Washington would become so relevant 
As it turned out, this clinic was swamped. Tony Dell. We had no way of planning for this kind of event or demand, and um, uh, you know uh, we had didn't have adequate staff. We didn't have adequate beds. Um, we were unprepared. Uh, but uh, in less than 12 hours, we have beefed up everything, and we're ready to collect and process an awful lot more blood. By coincidence, an association of several hundred health care workers from all across the U.S. was at a convention in Buffalo. A delegation arrived at the donor clinic wanting to figure out how they could all give blood. Um, I came today to donate blood to help whoever I can, because if this was me, if this was happening to me, I'd want people to help me, definitely. This wasn't something you planned on doing. Drawing when you, blood when you today? Got up this morning, you thought, uh, let's go give blood. That didn't happen. No, no. I've never donated blood in my life. Really? Really. And you're in the health field. Right. <laughs> I'd love to draw blood, but I don't like to give it. But I would. So why is today special? Because of everything that's happened. They, if they need our help, we're willing to give it. Right now, everybody's kind of living in this movie that we don't know, you know, okay, how's it going to end, that sort of thing. And we've all talked about that at different times today, how it feels very surreal. You don't feel like it's actually happening. And you don't know, I mean, if, is anything else going to happen or what's going to happen if it does. For most here in Buffalo, the mood was not one of terror, but of rage. If I could re-enlist, I would, because I'd like to get back at the person that took the instant lives today for uh, no reason at all. It's got me very upset. Others counted themselves lucky they were here in Buffalo today and not in New York or Washington, although there was great empathy with those caught up in the cities at the center of the disaster. My dad works there, so that was my main concern, to get in touch with him and see if he was still okay or alive. And um, after three hours, I was finally able to get in touch with him and found out that he was out to breakfast across the street when it happened. Luckily, thank God. Dan B. Arneson, CBC News, Buffalo. From Buffalo, let's take that live shot we've been showing you throughout the day. It's now night in New York City, the skyline of... The island of Manhattan, dramatically different now, minus the twin towers of the World Trade Center. Uh, it looks like an eerie calm settling over New York tonight, but we can tell you that deep in the heart of the southern end of Manhattan, desperate rescue operations are underway. Trying to get near the area where the towers uh, collapsed is still one of the biggest headaches as firefighters, rescue operators, still trying to get rid of fires that are causing all sorts of problems and uh, structurally unsound buildings that are t uh, on the verge of collapse in that immediate area. But we are starting to hear some incredible stories, uh, reports indicating that there are people inside the rubble, trapped and alive, using cell phones to call relatives to say they are there, trapped inside the rubble. Um, these kind of reports are uh, at this moment sketchy, but it does offer hope and the prayers that have been asked for by uh, uh, all who have been watching these stories throughout today uh, for those who are still trapped inside uh, the rubble. If our some are alive, which now reports seem to indicate that is possible, um, our prayers are with them as rescue teams try to get to that scene to get through the rubble and get to the people trapped inside. Uh, horrific totals expected as the casualties will begin to mount when the rubble starts to clear. Remember the twin towers of the World Trade Center uh, house on a normal day anywhere between 20 to 50,000 people, 110 stories of offices, two towers. The questions of who carried out today's attacks and how burn fiercely in the minds of Americans tonight. But we, we, but we do know that in the recent past, Canada has been used as a base for attempted terror attacks on the United States. The CBC's Terence McKenna has been preparing a documentary on the subject and has this report for us tonight. The most haunting foreshadowing of today's terror attack happened in Marseille, France in 1994. French commandos stormed an Air France jet which had been hijacked by Algerian Islamic militants. All the hijackers were killed. 159 hostages were freed. Seven had been killed. French authorities said the hijackers wanted to crash the plane fully loaded with fuel into Paris, if possible, into the Eiffel Tower. The trail from that case led French investigating magistrate Jean-Louis Bruguer to uncover a worldwide network of Islamic terrorists. His work has brought him to Canada and the United States. This is spreading over the world like a web. You know? 
So it's very difficult to, to, to grasp this new threat. But it's very, very dangerous because, because uh, their target is very different. They try to target uh, not only France, but uh, America. French investigators established links that led from the 1994 hijacking through the Paris subway bombs in 1995 and 96, and the trail eventually led them to a group of terrorists in Montreal, which included Ahmed Ressam, the man arrested at the American border with powerful explosives in the trunk of his car in 1999. Salim Jiwa covered the Ressam case for the Vancouver province. Well, I, I, I see the Ressam situation as a precursor of what was to come. Um, I, I see that as, as uh, I mean, the, the astonishing part is what, what Assam was saying was, was the number of people who are trained. For example, he stated that 60 people, six zero people, are ready and on standby in Italy. He, he named a number of uh, groups in Sweden, number of people in Germany. So uh, I saw that as a precursor. I was talking to a security source in the United States and just a month ago, and he indicated that the U.S. was very nervous still that uh, something would happen and they would be unable to stop it. He said, he said to me that uh, these people are not going to stop and you know it. Ahmed Rassam easily obtained a false Canadian passport and used it to travel to the city of Peshawar in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. There he made contact with the Osama bin Laden organization and entered a terrorist training camp in nearby Afghanistan for months of instruction in bomb making and assassination techniques. Islamic militants from many nations are trained in the Afghanistan camps. The bin Laden organization has been monitored for years by the U.S. security apparatus and the Situation Room at the White House. James Steinberg was deputy national security advisor in the Clinton administration. It's not simply a question of an individual belonging to one particular organization with one uh, particular target, whether it's the GIA in uh, Algeria or the Islam, Egyptian Islamic Jihad in Egypt, but rather a kind of loose network of people who have common uh, affiliations, common training, common associations, frequently linked to Afghanistan, which becomes sort of a pool of individuals who may be available to be involved in terrorist operations uh, elsewhere in the world. The Rassam case has brought to light numerous connections between the Osama bin Laden organization and Canada. Yes, indeed. Uh, there are other names, uh, as you know, uh, people who have, uh, who have direct telephonic links uh, in Canada with uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's right-hand man, uh, Abu Zubaydah. Um, there are people like that in Calgary. There are people like that in Vancouver. There are people like that in Montreal. There are people like that in Toronto. Uh, numerous telephonic links have been found with, with very sinister people uh, and very dangerous people in Canada. Suspected terrorists in Canada are monitored by the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, CSIS, and agents like Dan Lambert. Counterterrorism is the main priority of the CSIS in terms of its mandate. We have two-thirds of our resources are dedicated to counterterrorism. We work extremely closely with the RCMP, with the Department of Justice, with CIC and Customs within Canada, as well as U.S. authorities. Um, and in fact, I mean, we have, uh, we have liaison relationships with uh, 130 different countries and over 250 different agencies. What's valuable about the Rassam case is that it reinforces the, the, the necessity of this kind of cooperation. As you say, there were links in, in not only uh, between individuals operating in the United States, individuals operating in Canada, but also in Europe. And, and as we began to uncover them, I think it reinforced among officials involved in law enforcement and intelligence the critical need for this kind of transnational cooperation. Why would Islamic terrorists come to Canada? David Harris is former Chief of Strategic Planning at the Canadian Security and Intelligence Agency. I think in terms of Islamic extremists in Canada, they regard the proximity of uh, Canada to the U.S. as, as making Canada a kind of uh, Islamic extremist aircraft carrier for the launching of major assaults against the U.S. mainland. And that's something we've got to remember. Today's massive coordinated attack shows a level of sophistication well beyond what had been anticipated or predicted in the North American intelligence community. Most intelligence analysts thought a conspiracy of this magnitude would show up in the massive wiretapping and monitoring of suspected terrorists. Indeed, this is a complete failure of intelligence. Um, 
the United States, Canada, and Allied Intelligence Services for a long time will be dissecting uh, how such a major conspiracy that must have used the airwaves, may have used the internet as, as a contact point, uh, could get through and, and be carried out without anybody waking up. Uh, this is havoc that has been created, and I suppose many heads will roll, and, and there will be lots of post-mortems conducted on how such a major conspiracy could be concealed. Right. Right. Congresswoman Jane Harmon served on the U.S. Counterterrorism Intelligence Committee and has long pleaded for more resources to deal with international terrorism. Uh, what is uh, very worrisome is the goals of terrorists have changed. It used to be that, that terrorists would try to kill a few people and make a political point. Um, but as we stated in this uh, terrorism report that I worked on last uh, year, uh, the goal no longer is a seat at the table. The goal is to blow up the table. Peter, there was a lot of finger pointing at Canada after the Ahmed Rassam case, and it, it really led to uh, a lot of concern about how easy it was for him to take advantage of the refugee and immigration rules in Canada, and there was a lot of pressure on Canada to tighten up. There's no indication that uh, you know there's any connection between Canada and and the uh, terrorists that performed the uh, attack today. But in spite of that, I think you can see a lot more pressure on uh, Canada and America's other allies to tighten up and uh, to make sure you're not providing a safe haven for, for terrorists. All right, Terrence, thanks very much. Terrence McKenna joining us tonight from Montreal, and he is, uh, as we have told you, preparing a major documentary on this issue, which will be uh, running uh, in the weeks to come on The National. For more now on uh, who may be responsible for today's attacks and how the U.S. is likely to respond, John Thompson, a security expert with the McKenzie Institute in Toronto, and in Kingston, Ontario tonight, Harold Claypack, a professor of war studies at the Royal Military College. Uh, Professor Claypack, let me begin with you. Can you give us a sense of what you would assume is going on in the American intelligence community right now in trying to determine who's responsible for what happened today? Who's responsible in the sense of, uh, of the enemy side? Um, well, I think there's a huge effort obviously undertaken. There's a lot of people very, very confused. They are filling in all the gaps that they can find, and they're going after, I think it's already fairly clear, the most obvious uh, sources of uh, this sort of uh, sophistication and this sort of, uh, uh, of operation. I think it, once having said that, though, you, the first thing to remember is that this is a very easy thing in some ways to, to mount as well. That is to say, given uh, enough determination and enough uh, drive on the side of the terrorists uh, and some funds and some sophistication, you can do a lot of damage. So that uh, there will be a lot of work being done, but it's not going to uh, result in very much very quickly, I shouldn't think. All right, John Thompson, your thoughts on this angle, too, because I think uh, for most of us, it is hard to imagine just what kind of resources uh, the intelligence community can use at a time like this to, to try and determine real proof of who was involved. What do we know? Well, for a start, the uh, attack occurred in the United States and originated inside the United States, or it appears to. The uh, <clears throat> criminal activity, uh, the, the hijackings and all that occurred in the United States. So the lead investigation and uh, investigative body for this has to be the FBI, uh, and they're the ones who'll be beginning. And I suspect uh, they've already retrieved uh, airport uh, surveillance tapes from uh, Boston and Newark, and are trying to uh, compare faces to names and uh, try and get an idea of who actually uh, was responsible for the hijacking of, this of these aircraft. And that gives them a lead point. Uh, that they can work with and start to uh, sort of tug on the strings and see where they lead. After that, uh, forensics from the attack sites, but uh, it's going to be a long time before they get evidence out of the uh, the World Trade Center bomb, uh, r rubble. Now, we also uh, always hear these stories about the sophisticated satellite technology the Americans have at hand in terms of monitoring overseas conversations and conversations uh, between uh, people who they are trying to keep uh, uh, tabs on. One assumes that kind of uh, operation is used as well. John? Well, it's true, but they've had a hard time processing the material they get. That's one of the, uh, the recent complaints about the NSA in the United States, that the uh, the computers that analyze all the data they get have been crashing and been having problems. They haven't been modernized. The other thing is that uh, some of the Islamic fundamentalist groups are very well aware of American capabilities and have been uh, observing very simple things like signals intelligence, being very careful about what they say 
and when they say it and uh, how they say it using uh, for example uh, veiled speech to uh, refer indirectly to what they might be doing say uh, the delivery of uh, explosives might be referred to as say something over a cell phone you know did you get my flowers that I sent you and let's see how the NSA interprets that uh, a lot of people might be making remarks about the CIA as well but uh, the CIA, like a lot of other intelligence organizations around the world, their first reliance is on uh, the open press. And then after that, uh, their agents tend to behave uh, much the same way that a reporter would. You know, going to an area and going with your eyes open and your ears open and talking to people open and above board. Sort of the use of spies for human intelligence is, is very rare and very difficult, especially uh, in the Islamic fundamentalist community. These are people who know each other already, and they know each other very well. All right, Professor uh, Claypack, based on past terrorist uh, acts, do what we, does what we know about what happened today bear the marks of Osama bin Laden, uh, the person who many are suggesting already is probably at the top of the list of prime suspects for this? In some ways, yes, in the sense that it is, uh, ex has been expensive, it has, been, has required sophistication, etc. But it's not, again, all that difficult. If you take into consideration, for example, what it might have been, I think one thing that's being left uh, out of a lot of this discussion is that there are much more sophisticated and uh, much more technologically advanced things that terrorists can do. And the uh, thought that by improving our intelligence services alone, our defense services alone, we're going to be able to defeat this is really in many ways a dreaming and technicolor. The fact is that we didn't have a gas attack uh, of, of a massive level as many people feared after Tokyo subway. We didn't have biological warfare yet and this is an absolute monstrous and ferocious and incredibly uh, incredible in terms of its scope this attack but in some ways it was traditional in the sense that at least that we have had uh, kidnappings of aircraft or, or taking over of aircraft hijackings. We have had aircraft crash into buildings. We've had car bombs. None of that side of things is new and so in a way this may be a, a chance for us to get a lesson in before even worse things happen. I personally don't think we're going to be able to beat this, but we can improve our record with it in the face of this disaster. All right, joining us now, uh, our conversation, Rex Brynan, a professor of political science at McGill University. Uh, Rex, uh, what is your sense on the Osama bin Laden uh, question? Uh, do you think his uh, group could have been uh, involved in this, carried out this attack? Oh, I'm sorry. We uh, thought we were able to get through to uh, Rex Brynan, but uh, unfortunately he's not there. So let me carry on that same question to uh, John Thompson uh, in Toronto. Uh, the Osama bin Laden question, any doubt in your mind that he could have been uh, able to do this? Uh, some doubt. I mean, some of the characteristics of the attack seem typical of uh, other attacks associated with his network, uh, particularly the, the in this case, the very successful uh, attempt to cause massive loss of human life. Uh, and and the, the planning behind the attack seems, again, consistent. But um, the, the Bin Laden network has actually seldom used uh, suicide bombers. In fact, the only case I can think of off the top of my head is the attack on a U.S. warship last year. Of course, beyond that, uh, most terrorists con in conventional thinking like to pull off an operation with a large body count. And I think in this case, the Bin Laden network normally would have been content with the destruction wrought to the World Trade Center. But these other attacks, uh, the attack in Washington and the second attempted attack on uh, what might be Camp David, that's something else altogether, a phased series of attacks aimed after the economic damage and the human loss at the World Trade Center, this phased attack at American officials and American symbols in Washington, that's something else. That's something that uh, hasn't been seen before from the Bin Laden network. All right, we're going to have to end our conversation there. John Thompson joining us here in Toronto. Michael Claypack joining us from uh, Kingston, Ontario. We appreciate uh, your time, both of you, tonight. Thanks very much. Uh, coming up on the uh, 10 o'clock hour here in central Canada, top of the clocks at uh, the rest of the country as well, except, of course, in Newfoundland, where it's 11.30 at night. Uh, we're going to continue our special edition of The National here uh, from Toronto. More uh, examination of the story that is dominating the news at this hour. Attack on the USA. 
four airliners are hijacked, turned into devastating bombs. Thousands of people are feared dead. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. The world, shaken, recoils in horror. This is a special extended edition of The National. Good evening again. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Those of you who have just joined us, let us recap for you what has happened today on what has proven to be an unforgettable day, a day when the American population and the American people from across the world witnessed and U.S. President George W. Bush called it evil acts, the worst in human nature, a series of attacks that have been simply horrifying. At 8.45 this morning, New York time, a hijacked airliner filled with fuel was flown directly into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Shortly after 9 a.m., a second hijacked airliner slammed into the South Tower. The two towers burning was a shocking sight. At 9.40, the terror moved to Washington, D.C., where a third hijacked airliner flying just meters off the ground plowed into the Pentagon. Only minutes later, millions of horrified onlookers and television viewers watched as one of the massive 110-story office towers collapsed. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. Then another hijacked plane went down, this time near Pittsburgh. And finally, the one remaining tower of the World Trade Center disintegrated. As reports of the destruction came in, it was becoming apparent that the toll of the attacks would be high. It was U.S. President George W. Bush who first said what Thousands everyone feared. were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. And as the dust clears from Manhattan and Washington, the consequences of today's attacks are just beginning to be felt. Reporter Steve Irwin has been covering this story all day. He joins us with the latest from Manhattan tonight. Steve. Peter, the latest here right now is that the National Guard is coming in and trying to relieve some of the police officers and firefighters and other emergency workers who have been laboring for hours, desperately trying to get any survivors who may be buried in the rubble out and into the hospital. We actually have some reports, both from uh, radio and uh, some colleagues of mine here, that people have been getting cell phone calls from people trapped in the rubble. So there is a desperate bid right now to get in and focus on getting those survivors out. And the problem, of course, trying to get into that area is the fact that very much there's still a, a terrible danger there. Fire is still going, uh, uncapped uh, gas leaks uh, continuing on. The firefighters seeming to say that that is their biggest problem, trying to get to the area where possible rescues could take place. It's extreme danger. Uh, I was evacuated out of uh, lower Manhattan twice this afternoon because of gas leaks. We went in uh, the first time and police let us get quite close to the uh, site and then they came running down the street waving their arms manically telling everyone to get out get out now there's going to be an explosion and indeed uh, fires did start up and there were explosions uh, shortly after that what uh, I'm hearing also is that as I mentioned many National Guards are coming in now whether or not they're going to let any other people go in to volunteer to help is unclear I've heard reports of people coming in relatives uh, of people who are lost in the rubble right now begging to get in uh, to help and to do what they can but being turned away by either the U.S. Marshals, Police, or National Guard. All right, Steve, uh, stand by. We're going to uh, join a news conference that's just begun in New York now by Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Let's so hear what he has to say in this latest it's update. So on the, 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 the east side, the east side of, uh, of uh, downtown Manhattan has power. And exactly where the demarcation line uh, is, I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, over, over by one police plaza, going east, there's power. And I believe there's power at City Hall now. What, what, are your, what are your plans for the rest of the night, for the next 12 hours? And My, uh, staff, and will you all still be... We'll be, well, uh, we, we just had a, uh, a long meeting with all of the agencies to make sure they have the support that they need. Uh, they'll all reassemble here at uh, 8, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And some of the critical people <coughs> will stay here uh, throughout the night and we'll have representatives here and I'll be here for a while longer. 
Are you concerned about asbestos contamination? We, we uh, the, the health department has done uh, tests, and at this point is not concerned. But so far, all the tests that have, we've been we've we've done do not show an undue amount of asbestos. It doesn't show any particular chemical agent that we have to be concerned about. The the accumulation of it for people who are down there can become very very uh, irritating. And there were a lot of people whose eyes had been burned, and, but, I, but, I, but I don't think there's any chemical agent that we have to worry about Mr. at Mike, this point. Do you have any idea how many police officers and firefighters you are missing? Yes, we have an idea of how many we're missing. Can you tell us that? Well, we, we're, it's, a, it's a lot. I, it's a... It, it, Well, those were the comments of Rudolph Giuliani, who is calling a briefing here in the uh, city of New York tonight on the rescue efforts that are underway. The mayor, uh, Steve, as you were suggesting earlier as well, the big difficulty right now in terms of the rescue effort uh, is trying to fight the fires, uh, and the very uh, real possibility that other buildings could collapse as a result of the damage that's uh, occurred already. Um, also, this issue about numbers, the mayor staying away from them, questions asked about firefighters and police officers, uh, the mayor saying many are missing. Uh, he wouldn't go into numbers. And everybody, Steve, I think is afraid at this hour to even venture into the thought of, of numbers of what we could be dealing with here in terms of casualties. Peter, some of the numbers uh, I've heard quoted unofficially here uh, are enough to uh, literally uh, make you weep. It's, it's like a it could be as as much as a small town uh, being wiped out. It's uh, obviously is a, a catastrophe on an unprecedented scale in uh, in North America. One thing the mayor also uh, did mention was he has. Uh, they're not concerned with any kind of chemical contamination. That's something people uh, I witnessed on the streets uh, earlier today were very concerned about. Was that there may also be some kind of chemical attack here? Uh, I popped into one. Uh, hardware store and they had already sold out of the several dozen masks they had uh, and the one I bought was basically just a sanding mask that you would use to sand your floor which would be no good but it still continues to be a concern I know with many people here that I've talked with tonight as far as uh, the number of firefighters go uh, as I mentioned in an earlier report I talked to uh, one police officer who said he had lost a number of friends in, a, in an instant when the second tower collapsed and he suggested there may be dozens of, uh, of his colleagues and colleagues in the firefighting community who have uh, also perished in this. All right. Back into the uh, news conference by uh, Rudolph Giuliano, the, the mayor had, of New uh, York. A while earlier, so at, at least uh, closed until then. Mr. Mayor, um, Arab Americans for Peace issued a statement condemning the attack um, and asking for Americans and New Yorkers to withhold judgment until after an investigation had been completed, but they're also concerned about the fact that Muslim communities here in New York will be targeted for harassment both by law enforcement officials and by community members because of the nature of the attack. Uh, just, uh, just the opposite. They will, they will receive extra protection. Uh, that, that's the point of what I was saying earlier. Nobody should engage in group blame. Uh, the reality is wh whoever is responsible for this uh, law enforcement will figure that out. The United States government will figure it out. And the retaliation will be, will be I'm sure, very, very strong and uh, make an example out of those people. But uh, nobody should try to make that determination on their own. Nobody should blame any group of people or any uh, nationality or any ethnic group. The particular individual is responsible and the group's responsible. That's up for, to law enforcement and it's up to the United States government to figure out. And citizens of New York should, um, even if they have anger, which is understandable, and very, very uh, strong emotions about this, uh, it isn't their place to get involved in this. Then, then they're just participating in the kind of activity we just witnessed. And New Yorkers are not like that. So we're sensitive to that. The police department will have special patrols in those areas of the city. And anybody that tries to do anything like that will be arrested. Mr. Mayor, is there anything you could say to put to rest of the fears people have? Uh, everything is being done to try to make the city as secure as possible. Uh, the, the president, uh, the FBI, the federal government, the state, the governor, uh, the New York City Police Department, 
law enforcement authorities. Everything is being done that can be done, and uh, people should people people tonight should say a prayer for the people that we've lost, and be and be grateful that we're all here. And tomorrow, you know, tomorrow um, New York is going to be here, and we're going to rebuild, and we're going to be stronger than we were before. Last, last question. Police Commissioner Carrick, did you lose any top people in your department? Uh, no, we, not to my knowledge, not at this point. Uh, we have suffered losses. Um, there, uh, there was a contingent of, uh, of cops that was with the mayor and I, and uh, Chief Ganji and, um, and First Deputy Meehan. Uh, the mayor and I left them. Uh, we were gone about 10 minutes when the that portion of the building fell, and uh, I had a number of people there. Uh, uh, we haven't found them yet. Um, uh, so I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know yet. We're, we're still hopeful that we're gonna that we're gonna find people. And, and we, we have do, not we have not given up hope that we're gonna we're gonna be able to find some people. We we do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. Uh, I can't get into it right now, but we do know there are people in the building that are alive, uh, and we're making every effort to get to them. Are those members that saw those police officers? Excuse me? Are those police officers? There are some police officers, yes. How many Which building are they in? Uh, two that we know of. How many? Two? Two. Do you know which building there? Which building? We, I can't say right now. Have police officers been pulled from the rubble already alive? Yes, there are a number of people that were taken to the hospitals. Can Including people be heard from yes. inside the rubble? Is that how you know? Can people be heard? Uh, I can't get into it right now. Thank we you. Have, Thank we, you. We have a group of shelters that, um, that are available in Manhattan. Bayard Rustin High School, Seward Park High School. All right, School, the mayor Washington now giving... Uh, local information for the uh, city of New York, but that is the first direct official confirmation we've had from a, an official in New York City, the police officer standing behind the mirror, uh, deeply affected by the fact that he is convinced he has lost friends and colleagues today. But the first direct confirmation uh, that there are people alive in that rubble. He would not go into detail as to how, why he knows that, but we have already heard unconfirmed reports earlier this evening uh, that cell phone calls uh, were uh, being made to relatives uh, to suggest that they people were trapped inside uh, the rubble and were still alive and were desperately hoping uh, for rescue. Uh, the police officer saying that uh, rescue efforts are desperately underway now to try to get to people who are trapped inside the rubble. Uh, the other uh, piece of news at the top of that uh, uh, statement from the mayor is that it appears the uh, chief of the fire department, the New York City Fire Department, and the deputy chief both lost uh, today when those buildings collapsed. There were hundreds of firefighters inside the building desperately trying to help those who were trapped inside the building immediately after the uh, hijacked aircraft hit it uh, and before it collapsed they were trapped in the building when it did collapse. Back to uh, Steve Irwin for a moment in New York City. Uh, Steve uh, perched atop one of the, uh, the high-rises in New York City when you look around there now after this day. What, what do you see and what do you think? Well, what I see is uh, abandoned streets, which I've never seen here in New York. Uh, virtually there are no cars uh, on any of the streets in Manhattan, and the uh, occasional vehicle you do see go by usually has a cherry light flashing on the top of it and a siren, uh, hopefully carrying someone who's been pulled out of the rubble to a hospital where they can be attended to. Uh, I know for myself this has been a very uh, long day and the adrenaline is just starting to uh, to leave my body and it, it's a real kick in the gut when you start thinking about the numbers of people who actually perished today and the numbers of people who are still trapped in that building. I know uh, tomorrow, as the mayor said, New York will still be here, but when everyone wakes up here it's going to be a very different place and uh, a very different world. Steve Irwin, who has been reporting uh, for us today, uh, all day today, on the incredible nature of the story that's unfolded in New York. Steve, thank you. We'll be back to you again later on this night. Steve Irwin in New York City. Well, now back to the other epicenter of this terrible day, the American capital, and our chief Washington correspondent, David Halton. David, uh, what can you tell us about the latest from Washington?
Well, Peter, still a lingering sense of, uh, of disbelief and shock here. It's been a long time since F-16s have flown over this city, and uh, well, it's a long time since an infantry regiment has been deployed here. But if anything, I sense a little bit of reassurance tonight in a very strong speech, a state of the uh, a state of uh, a national address from uh, President Bush on TV, making the point very clearly, not only that the terrorists will be tracked down, but also that the countries who harbor those terrorists will be punished as well. This significant uh, because all throughout the day officials here have been telling us that uh, there are strong indications that Osama bin Laden based in Afghanistan is involved so this would seem to suggest that if that is borne out that uh, the Taliban government in uh, Afghanistan would be very much a, a target for reprisals but also strong words from President Bush Peter tonight about uh, uh, the need to restore to get government departments here back in business quickly and also significant references to uh, the the need for the, uh, to have a strong economy here. Uh, that important because a lot of concern here that the current slowdown in the U.S. economy might uh, accelerate into a full recession as a result of the uncertainty uh, and general insecurity over today's bombings. You know, David, uh, just as we witnessed in New York that the uh, uh, attempt to try to uh, stem the damage there, still fighting fires, still trying to deal with gas leaks is underway. Uh, reports uh, from Washington where one of the other hijacked aircraft slammed into the Pentagon building that they are still fighting fires there which could have a serious impact on their attempt to restore order tomorrow and that have the Pentagon back up and running very much so and uh, we've heard from the Secretary of Defense earlier this evening that uh, the casualties there are numerous in his words and that uh, there have been significant uh, fatalities during the attack on the Pentagon building so uh, clearly the uh, Pentagon will take some time before it gets back to uh, uh, to full operations um, there are a lot of uh, illustrations today from Congress a lot of uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans saying that uh, this is a time to rally behind the president which they appear to be doing but also questions being asked Peter about uh, why four hijackings could happen on the same day uh, why they could happen and not be detected and also significant questions about why there appears to have been a, a huge US intelligence lapse in the fact that officials here are openly admitting that they had no advance warning of these uh, bombing attacks and questions that I'm sure are going to linger for some time to come. David Holton reporting to us tonight uh, from Washington. Well, let's move from south of the border to this side of the border now as we go to Ottawa and our chief political correspondent, Jason Moskowitz. Uh, Jason, what can you tell us about the atmosphere in that city tonight? Well, we can tell you that the Prime Minister has cancelled his trips for this week. We're told that he'll spend a great deal of time at 24 Sussex, where he will be constantly briefed by security people, the RCMP, the armed forces. Clearly, information is what the Prime Minister needs, wants. He will continue to tell Canadians tomorrow to remain calm. He will offer all the help that Canada can to the United States. And uh, once again, Peter, at times like this, the Prime Minister is a man a few words and uh, he wants to know what exactly is going on before he has a lot to say. You know, Jason, uh, in spite of the fact that there was no ever any direct evidence today of any security threat to this country, there's no doubt that uh, uh, no chances were being taken in that city as uh, across the city all kinds of things were happening in terms of security. There was a time here this afternoon, early afternoon, Peter, when before uh, the normal traffic that you would see, the streets were closed off, the barricades were up in front of the Parliament building, visitors were asked to leave, you couldn't get on to Parliament Hill without showing your ID card from the street rather than from the door, certainly measures were in place today. All right, Jason Moskowitz. Uh talking to us tonight from our bureau in the nation's capital. Now, no one at Canada's airports and borders has ever witnessed a day like this one, tense, confusing, and chaotic. The CBC's Terry Malefsky is at the Vancouver airport tonight, where flights bound for the United States from Asia made an unplanned stop. Terry, what can you tell us? Well, Peter, as you know, Canada tonight is a kind of staging ground for hundreds of flights, no less than 500 flights that had the misfortune to be in the air when the attack on the World Trade Center unfolded on their way to the United States. They were diverted to Canada, Canadian airports were clogged and shut down, and this created a logistical nightmare, not least here in Vancouver, uh, because it's the only major Canadian airport on the West Coast that can handle these planes, and of course there's a huge volume of trans-Pacific traffic. All the 
flights to Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, Portland, San Diego, they all ended up here. Uh, 34 flights, uh, uh, roughly 5,000 passengers are here now and uh, a very difficult job trying to figure out what to do with them. Uh, all the baggage had to be searched because of uh, high security measures. Nobody knew, was there another hijacker perhaps on one of these planes uh, that had chickened out? Everyone had to be checked. Uh, people took as, as long as five hours after circling the airport, and then maybe an hour on the ground, then as much as four hours to get through security and immigration in order to move on, perhaps by bus to Seattle uh, or find somewhere. But uh, some people just didn't uh, find a solution. I just talked to a gentleman from Saigon coming on Japan Airlines on his way to Los Angeles where his home is now and he's wandering uh, the Vancouver Airport now uh, unable to find a hotel room unwilling to leave without his bags which are still being searched or they're stuck on the plane uh, we still have a lot of chaos but there's one common theme in most cases the pilots never told their passengers what the truth was only in one case that we've heard of did the pilot tell them the truth terrorist attacks in the United States in most cases they made excuses mechanical problem medical emergency and these passengers thousands of them had no clue what was going on until they landed on the ground you know Terry the assumption is here that the Americans are not going to allow air traffic over their country and until at least 12 noon tomorrow but one shouldn't assume if in fact that is the case that things will rapidly return to normal it is going to take hours if not days to sort out the uh, uh, air traffic that will have to leave this country to get back to the United States and then resume any kind of uh, normality to uh, air traffic in this continent. It may not be as early as noon tomorrow. Some of the passengers I've spoken to this evening said, well, they told us 48 hours, maybe I'll take the bus to L.A. Uh, and uh, there seems little doubt that there's no alternative for these people but to wait for the FAA, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, to decide that it feels comfortable allowing flights landing in the United States again and most people have been told by their airlines look they won't be in a rush to feel that way uh, they're not going to be con their, their principal objective is public safety they don't assume that they're going to open up uh, at noon tomorrow just because they say that it won't be before noon tomorrow most people here expect it to be a lot later than that all right Terry Malofsky reporting to us tonight from Vancouver in a situation that is echoed in various airports across this Canada across this country especially on the two coasts we've had uh, reports in St. John's and Halifax of a similar nature to uh, the situation in Vancouver and uh, there is uh, some similarities too in the uh, Pearson Airport situation here in Toronto well this attack was shocking both in its scope and in its devastation as the morning unfolded so did the horror here is the Nationals senior correspondent Brian Stewart with a detailed look at two hours of terror Early Tuesday morning, thousands of air passengers in the U.S. are boarding flights to the West Coast. Shortly after 7 a.m. in Boston, Newark, and Dulles Airport, Washington, an unknown number of terrorists on suicide missions board four separate planes, slipping somehow through normal security. 7.59, American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles takes off on time. A Boeing 767 carrying 92 passengers and crew. Within minutes, all four airliners carrying terrorists are up in the busy skies of the eastern states. In these minutes, New Yorkers are fighting morning traffic to get to work. As many as 50,000 normally enter the twin 110-story towers of the World Trade Center. It's an obvious terrorist target, was attacked eight years ago. But today, there's no sense of menace or alarm. At around 8.15, there's serious alarm among air traffic controllers who notice that Flight 11, having climbed to 10,000 meters above the Adirondacks, is veering off course and heading for New York. For the next 30 minutes, they watch an apparently hijacked plane streaking towards Manhattan. Then within minutes, they see a second plane veering off a western course, aiming directly for downtown New York. At 8.42, all hell breaks loose over New York as that first plane, Flight 11, crash dives straight into the North Tower of the Trade Center 
causing catastrophic loss of life. Only 18 minutes later, just after 9, a stunned city sees the second United Airline plane swoop unerringly into the side of the South Tower. And there's more on the way. At 9.38, American Airlines Flight 77 crashes by the west wing of the Pentagon. A Boeing 757 with 64 aboard, it had taken off from Washington's Dulles Airport before swinging around to dive onto the very command center of America's military. Minute by minute, horrors mount. Just after 9.50, the unthinkable. Back in New York, the entire South Tower of the Trade Center collapses in monstrous avalanche of concrete and steel, bearing huge numbers of wounded and rescuers. One doctor on the scene, Mark Heath, has a video camera with him and captures moments at ground zero. I hope I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's uh, incredible. Okay, I'm gonna have to go find people who need help. Can I get a toot? I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. Uh, that's good. Uh, okay. Back to you. This is the car I hid behind. It saved my life. Oh, wait, maybe it was this one. They say someone needs help. Yeah, Mike! Mike! Mike, come over here! Yeah! Anybody need a doctor? Who are you? Don't have oxygen. <laughs> you... Hello, Doc. Hey, that guy needs some oxygen. If someone can share it with him. 10-4. Thanks. They told me just to wait here. At this semi-station area. See if I can help. That's what I'm doing. They won't let me go any closer. No one can go in to get the people out. There's small explosions still going on. So far, I've seen some people who needed oxygen from the dust. No point trauma. Five minutes later, an unprecedented fear sweeps Washington. 10.05, the U.S. government, now fearing an all-out attack, even evacuates the White House. Presidential staffers are moved quickly out of the very core of the nation's capital. Now at 10.10, the fourth plane crashes. A United Airlines 757, Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco with 45 aboard, suddenly disappears from the radar and disintegrates as it crashes near Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Fifteen minutes later, at 1029, all U.S. civilian air travel goes to ground. International flights to the U.S. are diverted to Canada. Canadian airports start receiving scores of airliners that soon crowd the tarmacs. In New York, desperate attempts are being made to save those trapped in the remaining North Tower. Often, little can be done. Then at 10.29, the drumbeat of calamity reaches its peak. Incredibly, the North Tower of the Trade Center also collapses. In this aftermath, people scarcely believe their eyes. An event so threatening that shortly after 11 a.m., much of Manhattan is evacuated. 
amid scenes that seem almost out of science fiction. As it absorbed terrorist strike after strike this morning, the government of the United States went on a virtual war footing. The president, even commanding for a time from a bunker, prepared during the Cold War for nuclear combat. And probably not since Pearl Harbor has America felt more directly threatened or more fiercely determined to strike back. In just two and a half hours, from that first takeoff in Boston to the collapse of the second tower, the United States and the world were changed in ways that are still uncounted and surely still incalculable. For The National, I'm Brian Stewart. We go back to New York now once again for that shot, the nighttime skyline shot of New York City now minus the two towers at the World Trade Center. More reports coming out tonight now of people trapped in the rubble using cell phones uh, to call family members, uh, pleading with uh, support and asking for rescue efforts which are underway at this hour, but they're still fighting fires to get anywhere near the rubble. Um, one man caught under the rubble used his cell phone to uh, reach his family in Pennsylvania with a plea for help. Uh, his wife received a call from him saying he was still trapped under the World Trade Center. He gave specific directions and said he was there along with two New York City sergeants. Um, paramedics waiting to be sent into the rubble were told that once the smoke clears, it's going to be uh, a massive body count. Uh, emergency medical service worker Louis Garcia said initial reports indicated that bodies were buried beneath the two feet of soot on streets around the Twin Towers. Garcia, a 15-year veteran, said bodies are all over the place. So far, police officials say no people have been found alive, but they do say they have evidence, uh, confirmed evidence, that there are people trapped under the rubble. So tonight, the rescue efforts continue in New York City. In this country, word of the attacks stopped Canadians in their tracks. They gathered in front of televisions and public areas. They got on their cell phones to let others know. They broke the news to strangers on the streets. And all the while, they were trying to comprehend what they were seeing, what they were hearing. Norman Hermont now with the disbelief and horror felt throughout this country. Across Canada, people watched the unthinkable unfold across the border. As news of the enormity of what happened sunk in, office towers in Toronto started to empty. It's a terrible tragedy. We have someone there at the World Trade Center this morning at a conference, and we haven't heard from him. It's scary. I, I'm scared, I'll be quite honest with you. And I just called my wife a few minutes ago and said we're heading home, and she's, she's very happy about that. No matter where people were, the reaction seemed to be the same disbelief. It's like a movie, it's like it's not real. It's like you're watching a movie, you know? It's insane, it's just like a movie. It isn't, it, it's, uh, it's actually surreal to me um, to, to see it on TV and see major buildings collapse. For many people, there was sympathy for a country so tightly connected to Canada. For all the people who have died, please bless them, Lord, and their families. In Saskatoon, there were prayers from these students and questions about what comes next. What's going to happen in the next week or two weeks? Like what, what the United States is going to do? What if people are actually going to admit that they were the ones who did it and why they did it? In city after city, people were transfixed by what they were seeing. Some concerned events could now spin out of control. President Bush is already saying that he's going to hunt down whoever's responsible. I don't know. I'm just scared that we're going to have to be on our way to war. On also in. Everywhere, there was a sense after today, the world may never be the same. As of today, this will affect everybody around the whole entire world. No matter where you live in, what town you're in, it will affect you. So no. The question being asked more than any other, why? I just wish there wasn't that, that hate. Because that's, that's, that's a problem. The problem for many people now, dealing with the devastation so close to home. Norman Hermont, CBC News, Toronto. The main attack struck at the very heart of New York's financial district, and there too, there was havoc. The New York Stock Exchange will be closed tomorrow, and there will be ripples on financial markets around the world from Europe to the Orient. Havard Gould now on the economic impact of the attack. 
Closed in the chaos, it isn't clear when the Canadian stock exchanges will reopen. The American stock exchanges will remain shut for at least another day, as the world's biggest financial centre struggles to understand the extent of the losses, the buildings, the infrastructure, the people. Clearly there are going to be uh, some disruptions to financial businesses and to other businesses that were located uh, in the affected areas. Stock markets around the world slid when the attack started, but economists can only guess at the full impact to be felt in the days ahead. The big picture right now is extremely uncertain. We already had a lot of uh, doom and gloom about the global economy. This is just going to add to that. Um, very concerned for colleagues in New York, obviously. And um, it's, it's unprecedented what we're seeing happening, so impossible to predict, but I can't say it's going to be good news. The key, the U.S. consumer, the last pillar holding up the economy in North America. Americans have been resolutely spending in the face of mounting debt, layoffs and shutdowns. Now this. There is no question that the confidence in the U.S. has been shattered. We're, we have been in a recession, but this is going to be another blow. How U.S. consumers react may well decide whether the world is plunged into a global recession. Over the past uh, year, we've seen financial turbulence. But we've never seen the type of financial turbulence precipitated by these types of terrorist acts before, so to predict their outcomes is, is, is impossible. So only when the first shock is dealt with and when institutions like the stock markets get up and running again, only then will it be possible to truly assess the economic damage done here to the economies of the United States and the world. Haver Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Well, all day a lot of Canadians have been worried about people they know in New York City. Family, friends, colleagues. Joan Leishman now on how some Canadians spend an agonizing day watching and waiting. It has is embedded in the, in the building. I can't see from my, my vantage point whether it has come out the other side. The moment these pictures hit TV screens, many Canadians began to worry, especially those with family or colleagues in New York's financial district. I was talking to him two or three minutes before the plane hit. Len Pace of Oakville, Ontario is one of them. Pace's brother-in-law, Ron DiFrancesco, worked at the World Trade Center. He was in his office on the 84th floor of Tower 2 this morning when Pace reached him moments after Tower 1 was hit. I got through to him on the first try. Um, it was really short. Uh, he, he just... I said, it's Len. He said, uh, I'm okay. He obviously knew that, that the calls are coming and uh, he said, I'm okay, but I got to go. He could hear the, um, the sirens going off uh, or the fire alarms going off in the background. And uh, he's, uh, he's a broker, so it sounded to me like there was still a lot of, there might have been trading going on, although uh, I'm not sure of that. So I talked to him for 15 seconds. Uh, got off the phone and then phoned my brother in, in Montreal to tell him that I had spoken to Ron and that he was okay. And as we were on the phone, literally two or three minutes after I had spoken to him, he watched uh, the TV, he was watching TV live and watched the plane fly into the second building. We were both fairly technical, my brother and I, and we both sort of immediately said, I said, where, where did it hit? And he said, you know, where's, what's his office number? And we both figured that it was below what the office number was, where the plane hit. But, uh, you know, if the stairways are intact and he got out and he got down the stairs, then he's okay. But if he wasn't down the stairs, then he's probably dead. There was no final word for three hours. Start thinking of eventualities of, you know, funeral planning and uh, if he was still in there that there's no way that they would have found his body I don't think so just going through that process of grieving even without a body uh, there's all sorts of things that you start thinking about that uh, you know getting ahead of yourself maybe and finally you know after a, basically a couple of hours of trying to find out what was happening we uh, um, I decided to come home and I got here at about 11.30 or 12.30 and as I drove into the driveway my wife came out and gave me a big hug and said that uh, he's okay. They, he talked to, 
to marry my sister, and he's fine. Pace himself works as an investment realtor in Toronto's business district and knows of many others who had friends or family in the Trade Centre complex. There's a neighbour who's, who's got work colleagues down there who uh, uh, one of his colleagues uh, might have lost a couple of relatives. Um, and uh, I think that there's, you know, there's probably 20 or 25 people uh, within one degree of separation of, from me that, uh, that I know who, who would have worked down there. This is Len Pace doesn't know whether to credit luck or divine intervention, but for him, the extreme fragility of life became very clear today. This is a picture of him up at uh, our cottage last summer. You're never safe, I don't think, anywhere, uh, potentially. But you can't live your life in fear either. You have to, I think, uh, you know, live it. And, and you, you, you know, it, for me, a day like today really uh, uh, underlines that uh, sense of family that we've got. And uh, I think you have to enjoy that. You have to live life in the moment and, and enjoy the people around you and, and appreciate them because so when something like this happens, uh, you certainly do appreciate them. It's also been a frantic day for Cheryl DeMarco of Edmonton. Her son Michael is a systems analyst whose office was at the World Trade Center. He's there all the time. He works and works and works. And I thought we might have, we might have lost him. And I really was calling his wife to make sure that she was okay. She's got a new baby. And... Um, and then when I got the answering machine, I thought, oh my God, Michael, pick up. And he did, but he picked up thinking I was his office, calling back because they'd been cut off. And I said, this is what happened. Your, your building has been hit. Thank God you're at home. Moments before, Michael DeMarco had called into his office. The only words he heard were, oh my God. Then the phone went dead. DeMarco was calling his office to say he wouldn't be in this morning. What he had done was worked late the night before until 10 or 10.30, and then it's an hour trip back to Jersey where he lives. And his wife has just had a baby, three months old, so he thought, I didn't get home last night, I'll just stay and work from the house this morning. And um, thank God that he did, because had he gone in, I'm sure oh, the story would be different. Oh Although her own son is safe, Cheryl DeMarco remains shaken and concerned about what all this could possibly lead to. I cried all morning and I'm just, I am, I'm just sick inside because, and then my other son has been put on alert for Los Angeles. He's a sergeant with the police department down there. So I kind of feel, oh. I just hope everything is okay. I think everybody in the world is shaken up by this. It's so hideous. It's too early to tell how many Canadians have been affected by this tragedy. The Department of Foreign Affairs will say only that calls from anxious friends and relatives are continuing to pour in. For The National, I'm Joan Leishman in Toronto. As we mentioned earlier, the Canadian Blood Services says it's expecting a huge demand from the United States for blood donations. To find out the location of clinics and hours, you can call 1-888-2-DONATE. And to check on Canadians who may have been caught in the attacks, Foreign Affairs has a 24-hour emergency service. That number is 1-800-387-3124. Be advised, though, both numbers are extremely busy. Of course, once the scope of the attacks hit home, concern and anger spread quickly across the entire United States. The CBC's Diana Swain was on assignment in Florida when all this happened. She captured some of the reaction in that state. It's, it's monumental, the scope of the catastrophe. The enormity of what happened was delivered by a small screen. It's just madness, I think. Just kind of shocking. 10,000 people, and that's not even a final count yet, either. It's probably more than that. Here in small town Florida, where the local lumber yard has been around for decades. Probably the worst thing that ever happened in this country in the year of the only talk was about the attacks. Crazy, crazy people out there. I think it's an act of war, but uh, don't know who we're at war with. That's right, Jimmy. 
Fearful of more attacks, parents were taking no chances. I went and got my son out of school. She thought the airplanes were going to bang into our school. She wasn't alone. Parents rushed to take their children home. I was scared for him, and I know that in the schools, I used to work for a school, that they'll turn the TVs on and let the kids see what's going on, and I was afraid that he might be a little scared about it, too. I'd rather have him with me. When he sees what happened? Yeah. Teachers tried to keep the students calm while dealing with their own stress. What was your reaction to it when you realized what was happening? Well, I think everyone was shocked. I think any time the United States is attacked, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be in shock because we think it can never happen in the United States. No one here took any chances. Back at the lumber yard, talk quickly turned from anger to retaliation. Level a whole blind blood. change. A bunch of crazy people out there that have no respect for nobody. Well, a country that harbors a fugitive, they're no better off than the damn fugitive. No. They want the countries involved to pay. It. I just feel like if that's, if that's the country that is covering him, that they ought to level a whole country. We need to go back to an old fashioned isolation. We need to back up a little bit. We need to take stock. The attacks happened hundreds of kilometers away. But even here in small town Florida, people are traumatized and afraid. The reality of just how vulnerable they really are has been brought home with horrifying clarity. Diana Swain, CBC News, in Oakland, Florida. Fourteen hours ago to this minute when the first aircraft hit the first tower of the World Trade Center in New York City and it has turned into a disastrous day ever since that moment. Let, you, let us update you on the latest uh, angles that are being covered at this particular hour in New York City as we look live once again at the uh, pictures of the harbor looking across towards uh, the skyline of Manhattan. Um, there are reports now tonight in New York that police have arrested two people after intercepting a truck full of explosives on the George Washington Bridge. Now, there are no further details on that, and it's, uh, this is one of these things that you have to wait for further details, whether these are uh, people who were up to no good at this hour or whether it was a construction vehicle. We do not know, but we do know that it, uh, two people have been arrested after a truck full of explosives was stopped by police on the George Washington Bridge in New York. Also in New York, the mayor, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, confirming in the last hour that there are still people alive in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Police desperately trying to, and fire officials and rescue officials desperately trying to get to them, but having to fight fires and leaking gas problems to get there. They know they're alive because cell phone calls have been made to families. Um, CBS uh, reporting in the United States now that in Washington, anywhere between 100 to 800 bodies may be trapped inside the Pentagon building, also the target of a hijacked aircraft earlier today. And finally, uh, <clears throat> this information on U.S. military maneuvers. The uh, USS Enterprise, originally in the Persian Gulf, had started to head back uh, towards the Atlantic uh, in the last couple of days. It has now turned back towards the Persian Gulf. Military analysts are saying this may be a sign that the United States military is moving into place to perhaps make a strike against whomever it believes was behind today's attacks. Today's attacks made the world's major superpower look more vulnerable than ever. Tonight, officials at every level in the United States are saying never again. It is now a wounded nation ready to retaliate. As Carol Off reports, there are a lot of questions about how all this will ripple around the world. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. The United States of America shut its doors today and went into a state of fear and suspicion. Like a fortress, it sealed borders and for the first time in history closed down all air traffic. 
Oh, I think we're really off the scale in terms of any uh, uh, terrorist precedents. We U.S. terrorist expert Brian Jenkins says there's only one thing in American history that compares. I think people here are, are reaching for the only historical metaphor that they have, and that is Pearl Harbor. Um, this, in effect, will be the Pearl Harbor uh, of the beginning of the 21st century, a signal event that somehow is seen as as having some bringing about some fundamental change in how the United States may look at the world. The United States has been the target of terrorism for decades. A violent attack on a U.S. embassy in Beirut 20 years ago shocked Americans. But in 1993, when a bomb exploded at the World Trade Center, terrorism took on a new meaning for Americans. They were not safe, even in their own cities. The U.S. government considered this man the mastermind behind the World Trade Center bombing. Osama bin Laden is called America's number one enemy, perhaps the most wanted man in the world. Bin Laden is a wealthy Saudi businessman turned holy warrior. He has trained a generation of freedom fighters for Islamic extremism. The U.S. blames him for many attacks, including explosions in 1998 outside two U.S. embassies, one in Kenya, the other in Tanzania. By midday today, U.S. security personnel were saying they had good indications that Osama bin Laden is responsible again. He's considered the only one with an organization large enough to do this. John Ziegler is an adjunct professor of political science at Carleton University. But this is an enormously sophisticated operation, uh, both from the intelligence point of view as well as the operational one, and that limits the, the people who could be involved. And, of course, most of the fingers are being pointed at Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. But Brian Jenkins warns against blaming anyone specifically. It's always a danger that the, the, the analysis will, will look for someone to point to and that Osama bin Laden will invariably be our default category. Now, to be sure, Osama bin Laden is responsible for a number of attacks and could not be removed from the list of suspects. Uh, but we tend to uh, try to personify terrorism, a faceless phenomenon, uh, and, and, and identify in terms of a single villain. In the past, the U.S. has reacted swiftly and brutally to attacks against it. In 1998, American cruise missiles slammed into a pharmaceutical factory in Sudan. The State Department said Osama bin Laden was making chemical weapons there. The U.S. shot missiles at bases in Afghanistan that it claimed were training camps for bin Laden's people. The attacks were also to retaliate against the bombing of the U.S. embassies. But going to war against terrorists is not like conventional war. The difficulty with this one is Osama bin Laden has never taken credit uh, for any uh, terrorist attack and says that uh, it's only the anger at the United States that uh, provokes people uh, to take these responses and has not claimed any credit for it. And he's not likely to claim any credit for this one in that sense. So no one's taking responsibility, therefore the target is invisible. Buildings were still burning in Manhattan and Washington today when Americans were talking about revenge. I think it's a disgrace, and I think President Bush should act immediately without hesitation of the Pentagon and nuke every terrorist state in the world. Uh, I think that anger will demand some type of response that, that uh, is, is considered appropriate, although uh, I don't know what response can be and in what measure we would calculate appropriateness here. This is a major attack on the United States itself. We have never in our history uh, uh, suffered a, a, a blow of this, uh, uh, of this magnitude. The likely target for the U.S. would be Afghanistan, where it's believed the Taliban government gives refuge to Osama bin Laden. Taliban has denied any involvement. So has every other terrorist organization in the world. 
Without blaming anyone, President Bush only suggested retaliation would be swift and decisive. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. The political rhetoric out of the U.S. today suggests a lot has changed. The anti-terrorism campaign of the past is now called a war. U.S. politicians and pundits declared that anyone who harbors America's enemies will now have to pay the price. But identifying who or what the enemy is will be the first order of business. For The National, I'm Carol Off. Well, on a day when the world seems very confusing, we count on one person to help bring a certain clarity. Here's Rex Murphy with his point of view. What started this morning at 8.45 New York time, when the first hijacked airplane, passengers on board, was rammed into the first World Trade Tower, was the terrorist 21st century version of Pearl Harbor. What we saw and what we've been seeing all day from the heart of New York and the power center of Washington is a scene of deliberate carnage on a scale and visited with a suddenness that has produced an epidemic sense of shock <clears throat> all over North America. It wasn't just planes which were hijacked this morning. It was the idea that North America was a closed, protected space, was exempt from the dirty forces and staggering pain of present day history. We should pay some attention to the dreadfully perfect symbolism of the targets, the great towers of the World Trade Center in the very heart of the financial capital of America and the Pentagon itself, the symbol of power in the capital of power. The terrorists wanted to do much more than rain death on thousands of innocent ordinary people. They designed this series of actions as carefully as any playwright to carry an unequivocal message through these symbols that their enemy is America, its system, its wealth and its power and to carry the further message that the hatred of America in their eyes is so utter and perfect that any manner of deed and any number of deaths have their demented justification. Today's horrors have the added horror that they were a contemplated, a deeply thought about end. They were designed, and in that, as well as in the nature of their targets, they were the terrorist equivalent of a declaration of war. These acts were new and singular. They were meant to establish a new threshold they have brutally expanded the boundaries of what we must now, as part of our everyday psychology, consider possible. It was a serving of notice to this side of the world that this side of the world is no longer showmaster or spectator, that the brutalities and incitements and rancors from Northern Ireland to Kosovo, from the Middle East to Afghanistan, the stuff of our TV screens, which always take place over there, now have in the rubble, blood, and dust of downtown New York a first world local address. The curtain of our North American exemption from the actualities of the world's darker turnings has been breached in the first year of a new century. The truth of this could be seen even on the streets of Toronto, and I'm sure every major Canadian city. I say even because in this country we sometimes think next to the US that we are spectators too, not actors. But here too, the violence today had its impact. People were absorbed and anxious in a manner I have not seen during any other time. Who was responsible, what the US will do in retaliation, for retaliation there will be, whether today was a complete event or the beginning of some even larger one, these are the awful particulars that each passing hour will ripen. What is already complete is a change in the equation, in the psychological and conventional assumptions under which we, here in the West, have carried out our business and gone about our lives. We won't be talking about Gary Condit or the seating plan of the Alliance with quite the same fervor from here on in. We are no longer exempt from the madness and evil of our always unhappily, sometimes fanatic planet. September 11, 2001, terrorism has gone global. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. That is Rex's point of view. We know you will express yours as well. And as usual, uh, we will be ready to hear it 
through no matter how you send it to us by email, by phone, by letter. Just a reminder now, CBC News will remain on the air right through this night. We will go live to all important briefings. We will have analysis of any important developments. And we'll be following this story for many days to come. We have our teams dispatched throughout North America covering this story and around the world. For those of you here in Canada, and for those of you in the United States who have been watching us throughout this day on the USA cable network, it has been a day we will never forget. Night has fallen over New York and Washington. Tomorrow will bring new revelations and new angles to this incredible story. I'm Peter Mansbridge in Toronto.